to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. I might remember years ago hearing a sermon, uh, reading a sermon actually, that Dawson Trotman, the founder of Navigators, and the guy who put together the evangelistic um, uh, follow-up program for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, he had preached, and it was called Born to Reproduce. He said a person is physiologically mature when they can reproduce physiologically, and a person is spiritually mature when they can reproduce spiritually. I remember once meeting a man who used to travel the country preaching with Dawson Trotman. I said, tell me Dawson Trotman's stories. He said, one time he was in the Pacific Northwest. The church was pastored by a man Trotman had led to Christ and discipled. And the pastor introduced Trotman that morning as the man who led him to Christ and discipled him. And Trotman said, it's true, I had this privilege with your pastor. That's why I'm not afraid to do what I'm going to do now. He called the pastor back to his side. It was a, less, a more, more formal day than now. And in a full congregation, he said, I want you to point me to somebody in this congregation that you've led to Christ and discipled. He points back to Matt. Trotman says, Matt, stand up. Point me to somebody in this congregation you led to Christ and discipled. He points across the way to Larry. Larry, stand up. Point me to somebody in this congregation you led to Christ and discipled. He points across the way to Beth. Beth, stand up. It goes like that for seven generations. We say extraordinary. But that's because the normative has become the extraordinary today. Continue to reproduce reproduces. That is God's calling upon you. Paul tells Timothy that, and I believe it carries on through that voice to you this day. You're not building kingdoms to yourself. You're building people for the kingdom. It's very, very important. And the next thing he says in chapter 2, again, all this a crescendo building up to chapter 4. He says to Timothy, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Sometimes we get distracted by so many things, as Jesus himself told Martha. Jesus had fed the 5,000. The people were ready to make him king, he, make him an economic savior, somebody who could fill their bellies, meet them at the place of their physical need. That's important. And don't minimize the importance of that. But never at the expense of remembering Jesus. And Jesus saw their motives were goofy. Puts his disciples in a boat, sends them to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, dismisses the crowd. He goes up under the mountain to pray. That's the night he went walking on the water. The people wake up the next morning. They're hungry once again. They wonder where Jesus went, so they go around the lake and they find him on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, preaching the gospel once again. And they come to him and they said to him, Moses gave our fathers bread in the wilderness and they did eat. Jesus said, you have your history all wrong. It wasn't Moses who gave your father's bread in the wilderness and they did eat. It was my father who gave your father's bread in the wilderness and they did eat. And if you knew who it was you were talking with now, you would ask him not for the bread that leaves you hungry day after day, but for the bread that leads to eternal life. And they said, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And he said, I give you myself. Hmm. And they turned to leave him. He wasn't enough for them turns to the twelve and he said, will you leave me also? It's the most poignant moment, I think, in Jesus' life, apart from his crucifixion, resurrection, and his agony in Gethsemane. Peter said, Lord, leave you. Where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Remember Jesus. Nothing is more important to you than him. Find your fulfillment in him. And if you struggle to find fulfillment in him, then pray that through. Work it through. Share it with close friends. Get them surrounded until till your ministry is rooted in Christ. He says that to Timothy. And we hear it in his voice today to you and all pray. He says also in chapter 2, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. That's a spooky, that's a spooky comment. As if at this moment we're ready. As if there will be no improvement in days to come. As if somehow we won't solve all the problems that we were faced with in the past. I don't think that that's what it means. I don't think there's pretense in this text as if to suggest somehow we've got it all figured out. If you're going to handle the word accurately, my guess is you'll handle it with a degree of humility. We'll talk more about this when we get to chapter 4. But I think that God works through flawed people, not people who have it all together. As a matter of fact, it's the only kind of people he has to work with. I don't think anybody's very life skilled. I think I mentioned this to you guys at your wedding. Nobody's very life skilled. Nobody's ready to get married. 
If they waited till they were, they would miss out on all those dreams. Nobody's ever ready to have children. If they waited till they were, the whole human race would in this generation. <laughs> Nobody's ever ready to minister, to assume responsibility for the souls of the people. But if we waited till they were, till we were, who would do this work? Everybody operates at a level of awkwardness. A toddler learning to walk falls down and gets bruised. A six-year-old taking the training wheels off of the two-wheeler falls down and gets abrasions. The adolescent picking up the skateboard, learning how to ollie or take on the half-pipe, sprains an ankle or breaks a wrist. And the young couple moving into years, a lifetime of ministry. You get some bumps and bruises, you make some mistakes, and so on. If you're not awkward someplace in your life in ministry, you're not growing. And then you're not going to be handling the word accurately. Because you'll be pasting the word across things that you're doing and not realizing. And it's not just a reinforcement for where you are in your goofiness. Your goofiness keeps you driven to the text and honesty. Looking for its applications that you might make them to others in ministry. It's hard to keep it all in balance. But I would say one of the ways you know that you're accurately handing the word of truth the bellwether will be what's going on at home. How it is with your marriage. How it is with your children. Do your children feel like they can never say they need time with their dad because they don't feel like they're worthy enough to compete with Jesus? If you're handling it accurately, I think that, you know, we, we don't walk a smooth path through these things. The calls of home, the calls of ministry will produce this constant pressure, this constant tension, but it's a good tension. It's a tension that will keep you mindful of these things all the time. And that mindfulness of real life and real text will help you handle the word accurately. I believe this is true. Listen to the voice of home and it will help. Also, he tells us in chapter 2, verse 21, that there are many kinds of vessels. Some are gold, some are made of uh, uh, pottery and so on, made from earthenware. Various kinds of vessels with various qualities for a wide range of uses. But he says the thing that qualifies a vessel to be used is, is it clean? Basically, Paul's telling Timothy, keep short accounts with God. Keep your heart pure with Him. Go to Him in the total honesty of opening your hearts. And I don't know why. I'm sure, Pastor, you've preached on this before. Uh, Psalm 137, how blessed are those who bash Babylonian babies' heads against the rocks. We don't hear often sermons about these things, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was preacher, because I know your pastor, and I know he's a man of integrity and honesty. But also Psalm 109, I pray, Lord, that all my enemies' children will be orphans. We don't hear many prayers about those verses. We don't hear many sermons about them either. I don't think God wants us bashing anybody's baby's head against a rock. But haven't there been times you felt like you just wanted to shake somebody? What do you do with those feelings in your heart? Is your faith in irrelevancy at that point? Or is God saying, keep your heart open to me. Bring these things to me as they occur in you. Keep short accounts with me. Keep your heart clean. Press out the pus. I'm a safe relationship. Come to me. Own me like that. And then he also tells him the goofy times are ahead, but he should stay rooted in the scripture. Chapter 3 underscores that throughout. I, I, I believe in your life, Kevin, there's going to be so many challenges. And there are going to be some challenges that, that you don't have a text for. You're going to find goofier and goofier things in our culture as it begins to unravel. Traditional families falling apart and, 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 and people trying to make the most of the messes that been made of their lives and they're people God loves and you're going to have to walk them through those patterns and the patterns aren't all set up in here. What do you do? G.K. Chesterton said we can make two mistakes with tradition. One, we can reject a thing because it was happened this way in the past. Two, we can just accept it because it was happened, it happened this way in the past. He said the best thing to do with tradition is in every new challenge always leave a chair at the table and give them. The Word of God is a book that speaks to you. And you stay rooted in it. But if you read the word, you'll see that God gave Exodus. And after he gave Exodus, 40 years later, he gave Deuteronomy. Why? He wasn't sitting up in heaven saying, oh, I didn't think about this. I should have thought about this before and I could have given it to him at the time I gave him Exodus. No, he gave him Exodus and let him wrestle with it for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, it's interesting because in the middle of it, in the book of Numbers, he describes how the property is going to be divided in the promised land. It's going to be divided through the male members. And the daughters of Zelophehad come up to Moses right after he makes a pronunciation. 
And they say, we don't think this is fair. If I was living back then and the daughters of Zelophee had the same hat and I was standing there, Moses, I'd have moved my distance from them because the ground was going to swallow some people <laughs> up at those times. But Moses takes credit listens to them. Something that wasn't already described in Scripture. And they bring up a challenge. And Moses says, let me pray about that. Let me go to God for that. And God says the daughters of Zelophee had a right. Which means God was affirming that it's okay to think through applications beyond what's given in the text itself. We have these coordinates and have a trajectory of theological thought. You have Exodus, Deuteronomy. You have the history of Israel with their successes and failures. You have the prophetic words as correctives. And finally, you come to the ultimate coordinate of all time. You have the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible was a book written in an agrarian age, but it has application in an industrial age and in a technological age, and whichever age will come next. Keep rooted in the text, the scriptures say. Follow its coordinates along the trajectory of your thought and apply it to the circumstances with confidence that come before you in ministry. And I think that it's going to get goofier and goofier in the days ahead, Kevin. But stay rooted in the text, true to the text, confident in its applications when circumstances come up. And now with that behind us, let's look at this text. Preach the word. Just a few things to say. One, echoing what we said before, be confident in the text. It was not a word that was once spoken, but a word that still speaks. Handle it well. C.S. Lewis, you knew you were going to get a C.S. Lewis or something. <laughs> C.S. Lewis once said that the worst of bad men are religious bad men. The quicker I might be willing to die for my faith, and a person who has a gift of faith might be willing to go there. The quicker I might be willing to die for my faith, maybe the quicker I'd be willing to kill for my faith. That good things in a fallen world can be abused. That even religious people can sometimes confuse their own opinions for text and paint a thus saith the Lord across their own ideas. The Bible warns about it in the book of Ecclesi the, the book of Ezekiel. Beware of the false prophets who say, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not said. They were zealous, but they were zealously wrong. If you're going to be a person of the book, you want to handle it rightly. And you want to recognize that we can sometimes go awry in these things. So be a diligent student. You've studied the Greek text. You've studied the Hebrew. You know the Bible. Parse the verbs well. Decline the nouns. See the syntactical relations between the words and understand the text. And if it goes as far as that, then the words will drop off right off the pulpit, right to the floor, because it will never make the segue to the hearts of the people in your world. It's good to know the text. It's important and vital. There are no last words. That doesn't mean you can't have sure words. Know the sure words, but keep alive the wonder in the text. The truths that you know can be plumbed deeper. They can be applied wider. They can be seen in some sort of coherent relationship with other truths you understand. But minister with a sense of awe and wonder as you model continual growth and understanding of the text. Preach the word by knowing the text. Second, preach the word by knowing your people. It's not only important to parse verbs and decline nouns. It's important to parse the fears of people's hearts. To decline the broken hearts and broken relationships that exist in their congregation. Let the word become flesh and dwell among your people every day. The greatest Christian communication principle is that the word became flesh and dwelt among. Know the people in your congregation. I, I know of situations where there are pastors who hide themselves away in their study all the time. You need to be diligent to hide yourself away and make sure you're preparing well. But you need to be involved in people's lives. Be present with them. Be engaged with them at some level so that you know their hearts and you can speak the word confidently to the real issues that are going on in men and women's lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this. He's in prison. He's getting ready to die. And he sneaks out of these love letters to his fiance. And in one of them, he wrote this. I thought I could acquire faith by endeavoring to lead what might be termed a holy life. Later, I discovered, and I'm still discovering to this day, that one can acquire faith only by leading an entirely worldly as opposed to otherworldly life. By worldliness, I mean living amid the world's abundance of duties and problems, successes and failures experiences and perplexities. 
If we do that, we cast ourselves completely into the arms of God. We take seriously not only our own sufferings, but those of God in this world. And we share Christ's vigil in Gethsemane. That, I believe, is faith, is metanoia. And that is how one becomes a human being and a Christian. I am thankful to have recognized this, and I know that I could only have done so on the road I have traveled. That is why I reflect with gratitude and serenity on the things past and present. Now Bonhoeffer the Lutheran said that, but Martin Luther said something very similar. He said, this life, therefore, is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness. Not health, but healing. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we shall be, but we are growing toward it. The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road. All does not yet gleam with glory, but all is being purified. There's a great account of, uh, in, in Frederick Beekner's Telling the Truth, the Gospel, as tragedy, comedy, and fairy tale. These were his Yale lectures on preaching. And he tells the story of a pastor in a New England church who's ascending the pulpit on a Sunday morning. And he's got in his congregation, almost unbeknownst to him, people in the congregation with various struggles. You've got a young boy who's home from college, and he's sitting next to his mother who goaded him in coming to church. And they haven't had a good relationship, but they're sitting there, and they're among those he's ministering to that morning. There's a young woman who feels a little kick inside of her, and she knows she's pregnant, and she doesn't know who the father is. There's another man who's got a little bit of financial work that he has to go in and either give approval or disapproval to on Monday morning. And he's struggling with what he should do because one might mean more money in the coffer and the other might mean less. And there are people of all kinds of struggles in that congregation. And as the pastor ascends the pulpit, he pulls a little chain on the pulpit light and he deals out his notes like a Mississippi riverboat gambler deals his cards. And Beekner says, and never have the stakes been higher? Remember, these are people that you're ministering to. When you preach the word, you know the word, but know your people. They're looking to you. They're looking to hear God's word for you. It's a scary thing. When all of you desire to be teachers, realizing as such you'll incur a stricter judgment, that makes me shake in my boots. Be better for you if a millstone were tied around your neck and you were cast in the sea. I remember reading in a Bible commentary one time, somebody's trying to decide, is that the 2,000 pound lower millstone or the 200 pound upper millstone? Must make any difference. That's a nonsensical discussion. No matter what it is, you're going down. Don't abuse responsibility when it's thrust upon you so the immediate thing is to say, I'm not going to involve myself in any kind of responsibility. There's another role in scripture, and that's the role of the man who was given the talents and buried them. Woe to you if you don't assume responsibility when it's thrown upon you. Woe to you if you abuse responsibility when it's placed upon you. How are you going to do that? An utter dependence upon the Lord Jesus as he makes you a man of the book and a man of the people. But I think in order to do that, then, we move to a third application of this text, and that is not only know the word, know your people, but know yourself. Know yourself. Know that you are a man deeply loved by God, with a love that is ontological. God is love. Therefore, his love is not diminished by your failures, nor is it improved by your successes. When you stumble and find yourself face down, he loves you and forgives you. He comes alongside of you and nurtures you and picks you up so that you can get back into the game. He loves you in such a way that out of his love, you minister that kind of love in a similar manner to those around you, that those who come in contact with you will know one thing for sure. They are loved by Christ because they see your love for them. Know yourself. There's a great passage, and it's uh, from Ralph Waldo Emerson. I'm not a big Emerson fan, but he gave a, a, a lecture at Harvard Divinity School in 1838. It's called the uh, uh, Divinity School Lecture, 1838. And, and Emerson, in the middle of this long lecture, he says, um, I once heard a sermon that tempted me to say I would never go to church again. He said it was snowing outside and you could see the meteor of the snow 
as it fell through the window. He said the snow was real. The sermon was spectral. In the sermon, you never got an idea through the whole message if this pastor had lived one moment of real life, had ever plowed a field, had ever planted a field, had ever weeded a field, had ever harvested a field, had ever had a crossword said to him, or in an unfortunate moment, had ever said a crossword to somebody else that he had to repent of and grow through. You never knew if he had been in love or been brokenhearted in love, if he had laughed or if he had cried or if he had lived one moment of real life. <clears throat> Emerson said, I think the people in that church must live singularly boring lives that they would ride to church to hear this kind of dribble on Sunday morning. <laughs> know yourself. Know the ups and downs. Know the struggles. Make sure that you're growing. Surround yourself with friends. Learn from your mistakes. But be a real man and minister to real people. A real text that speaks to the ups and downs of life. So this is what I'd say. Um, one other thing about knowing yourself too. I remember Stephen Barabas, he taught at Wheaton College years ago. He's a theology professor. I got to know him when I first moved to Wheaton in the 1980s. We used to meet every week for lunch. A small group surrounded us and we would meet. But I would talk with him often. And I said to him, tell me something about your story, because I heard it. He was at Princeton Seminary, and he said right when he got ready to graduate, Emil Bruder, who was a professor there, gathered the graduating students together, and he said to them on this one day, boys, be good men. Boys, be good men. You could be the greatest preacher in the world. You could be the deepest theologian that ever walked the face of the earth. But if you're not a good man, you've disqualified yourself. Know the word. Know your people. Know yourself. Be a good man. And then I just have to end with one word of advice on my own part. We use Paul right now, but let me, let me give you one word of advice all on my own. When I first became a youth pastor in 1974, the senior pastor I worked with said, go around and talk to 10 different people. Tell them, ask them advice in the ministry. I went around and talked to all these different people. The best word of advice I got actually was from an insurance salesman who ran a college ministry at a church. It was a college ministry that Josh McDowell used to attend. He was the, the guy that led Roberta Hestinus to Jesus, who later became president of Eastern College, where Tony Campolo taught, and also uh, taught at Fuller Seminary. This guy had an unbelievable ministry. He was an insurance salesman, never left his business, but he was a guy that had been, somebody had reproduced the reproducer. And I said, what advice do you give me? He said, three things. And I licked my pencil and I got out my paper. He said, number one, love the people. I wrote it down, love them. Number two, teach them. Number three, love them some more. Still the best advice I've ever got. Love them, teach them, love them some more. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I worship you for Kevin and Aubrey. I worship you that you, from the, before the foundation of the world, knew that you would bring them together. Knew that they would have a family together. Knew that they would be in ministry together. Beauty and the beast, it seems to me. <laughs> Not a match that any of us would have conceived of, but one that was on your mind and heart for all eternity. I worship you for the way you twine these lives together. I worship you for the way you've called them into ministry. And now I pray, Father, not only for the generation they minister to, but that you would so bless their ministry that it would breathe on through to the generation that would follow and the generation that would follow after them. That three generations will be impacted by the ministry of this couple. I ask this in Christ's name and for his glory.